Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, what was going to be my swan song for the uh, Galloway Glens and these events, but uh, it's not a swan song now. We've got another event in a fortnight, so maybe this is my duck swan I'm not, uh, song, I'm not sure. Anyway, tonight we're going with uh, Birds and Our Changing Lands with uh, Chris Rolly, ex-RSPB, and Roger Croft, CEO of uh, the SNH. Um, tonight's event will be looking at the uh, eminent artist of the area, Donald Watson, and how he was inspired by our landscape and how our landscape has changed um, since. So, without further ado, um, we will move on to the first presenter. Now, Chris Rolly, uh, I've known Chris for oh, probably 20 years, on and off, sort of bumping into each other professionally. Uh, he's originally from Ayrshire, he was a teacher for 10 years before he moved to Darai about 30 years ago to become. Uh, to work for the RSPB. Um, he's been one of the leading lights of conservation in our region for many years and set up really important projects like the lots of the Red Kite Introduction Project. Chris is going to, has been a personal friend of Donald Watson and Chris is around about to start now on his presentation on Donald Watson's birds. Over to you, Chris. That's it. I think we're going. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I wish I could see you all. Um, I've never done this before. This is my first um, Zoom meeting as a presenter and I'm very, very nervous. So please um, bear with me if I talk too loudly or, well, I'm going to ramble anyway, so you'll, you'll need to bear with me on that one. Um, but uh, I'll just find my laser pointer and get kicked off. Um, Donald Watson uh, was born in 1918 in Cranley in, in Surrey uh, of a Scots father and an English mother. And he was painting birds, drawing birds, um, before he was five years old. And initially he um, imitated the uh, wonderful bird drawings and paintings of Archibald Thorburn, uh, who was a near neighbour. And indeed, uh, Thorburn um, invited Donald to come for tea. He'd heard of Donald's um, uh, artwork and, and invited him to come for tea in 1930 when, um, when I think that's it now. Uh, so he went to have tea with Archibald Thorburn in 1930 and of course that meeting had a great influence on Donald uh, and of course inspired him to, to, to greater things. Um, he was also influenced by other bird artists of course, um, notably um, Joseph Crawhall and um, Seabay uh, and later uh, Eric Enyon and, and others of course, but um, uh, he was in, in wider art terms, he was very fond of the French Impressionists, who also inspired him, and the French landscape painters. People like um, Cézanne, uh, Corot, Delacroix, uh, and Monet, of course. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of wildlife art, his great... Um, I'll do that then. Um, <laughs> but his great... Um, his great influence in terms of wildlife art was Swedish artist Bruno Lillifors, who Donald thought was really a master of wildlife art. His style was very spontaneous. He painted outdoors. And, uh, and I've got a couple of his paintings here to give you a, a, an, an example of how good an artist he was. He, um, he was uh, very photographic in his, his earlier years, but always with an impressionist touch. And this is Lily Ford's painting of, of a fox. And you can, if you look at the, the face, you can see how photographic that is, but equally surrounded by impressionistic tones. Uh, and then in his later works became more uh, impressionistic. And I think this is Lily Ford's again. And again, you can see, if you know Donald's work at all, um, how influenced he, he was by Lily Ford's. This is very, uh, very um, evocative of, of Donald's uh, paintings too. And just, I'm very conscious that many of you in the audience will know exactly where we're talking about in terms of um, the Glen Kens and Galloway, but there, I'm also conscious too that there might be some from further afield who don't know the area that well. Well, the, um, the, the subject of our um, uh, talk uh, tonight is, is this area here, is the, this is the, um, the, the Galloway and Southern Ayrshire Biosphere designated by UNESCO uh, in terms of its outstanding uh, landscape and natural heritage features and Donald uh, lived in the town of St John's town of Doray just to the the east of um, the middle of the biosphere there I don't know if you can see my cursor or not as I try to move it uh, so, so here's St John's town of Doray and in fact that's where I'm talking from now 
Um, this is one of Donald's painting. Donald married his wife Joan in Ayr in 1950, and a year later, the following year, in 1951, they moved to St John's town of Dorai. And here it is in the middle ground of this wonderful painting, painted uh, in 1951, very shortly after the couple set up home um, in a house in, in the village there in front of us. It looks away to the background, to the, the rinds of Kells in the, the background there. Um, uh, it's painted very, very quickly out of doors. This is this was Donald's style in those days, a very loose impressionistic style in the 1950s. I absolutely love it. Uh, we can see a couple of Kalu here, of course. They were a great feature of the landscape back then. They're still there, but in far fewer numbers now than they, they once were. Uh, and I'll come back to that later in the talk. But uh, back in 1951, um, the agricultural situation around Ori was one of mixed farming. Uh, most farms had an Arab component. Uh, very often they had some barley or some oats, some, some turnips certainly, and of course this all added to the variety of wildlife habitats that attracted the birds that so attracted uh, Donald, as well as of course the quality of the light in Galloway. Um, things have, have changed of course since, since those days. Um, uh, and um, the farming systems have changed. Back then, there were lots of curlew, as I said, lots of lapwing, um, but of course, the, the land use has intensified and, and um, the lapwings have declined. They're still there, but in far lower numbers and still declining, and so too are the curlews. But of course, this painting was painted in 1951, which was 20 years before, before silage. And back in those days, corn crakes, the bird on the right-hand side, uh, were abounded around the, the, the grasslands of the, the, the lower valleys and Donald saw corn crakes in the village of Dorai. Sadly now of course silage has banished these birds to the, the Western Isles where hay is, is still cut but cut very late. It was all hay back in those early days when Donald first moved to Dorai. And this was a picture I took of the same, uh, roughly from where Donald sat when he painted that. Of course, he was just up the road from home. Uh, he would take a flask with him. He could pop back home for lunch. Um, but this picture was taken from roughly where Donald sat when he painted that painting back in 51. And this is Dorai. It's grown a little bit. Um, and But essentially, it's pretty much the same, apart from the, the intensification of the agriculture. There's some forestry in the background there. We'll come back to that later. And sadly, Waterside Hill here, much to the, the, um, the disgust of, um, of most of the locals in the village, that Waterside Hill is going to be planted up uh, very soon as well, which is a great shame, but more of, more of that later. Uh, we move on now to 1952, um, uh, and this is a painting that Donald painted again outdoors, not that far from Dalry, just a few miles up the glen. It's looking towards the Rinza Kells in the background there. This is Poharo Burn, and, um, and this is Forest Glen. And he painted this out of doors. I'm very lucky enough uh, to, to tell you this painting hangs in my chimney breast. I absolutely adore it. And closer inspection reveals a couple of raindrops that it must have been raining in the day when, when Donald painted it. And, um, and I just love the, the way Donald gets depth. It's, it's a, this optical illusion that, that artists have of creating depth. And he's done that to great effect there with the Rins of Kells in the background. The painting was once owned by David Bannerman of Bannerman and Lodge, that famous set of, of bird books from the, the 1950s. And there would have been even greater depth in this painting had David Bannerman not asked Donald if he would tone down this, uh, this rock in the foreground here. And it's still a marvelous painting, but I'd love to have seen it before Donald toned it down as, uh, as Bannerman asked him to do. Um, here we are. Uh, and this paint, this picture I took just a few days ago in, in, in virtually exactly the same spot that Donald uh, sat in. This is, I'm sure this is the same rock here that he had to tone down in the painting. Um, it looks pretty much the same except to say that the hills in the middle distance there are now clothed in conifers. Back in 1952, uh, when Donald painted the scene, uh, they were covered in golden clovers and, and breeding curlew, whops as they're called in this part of the world, and it was a glorious place. It still is, but of course forestry has um, brought a great change to, to many of the bird populations, and Donald witnessed this, of course, over the three decades following his arrival there in the 1950s, as because progressively through the, the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s in fact, um, Galloway and, and Southern Ayrshire were um, successively planted up with, with um, alien conifer forests. 
Great time of change. Um, this picture will be taken in the early 1960s, but this scene will be very familiar to Donald. It's Back Hill of Bush in the, the heart of the wilderness area, in, ha in the heart of the, the biosphere. Um, it's just after the Forestry Commission have planted up the, the surrounding uh, habitats. Uh, and very soon this became a, a dense conifer forest, as did many of the, the landscapes of, of um, southern Scotland. And of course, that brought a, a great change to the, the, the bird populations. One of the beneficiaries of the initial removal of the sheep and the recovery um, of, of the overgrazing of many of the areas was this bird. And of course, this is black grouse. Uh, they abounded in Donald's day. Uh, there were literally hundreds, if not thousands of them across southern Scotland in those days. This, is, this painting was painted in the 1950s. Again, it's in that very impressionistic style that Donald uh, had at that time. Uh, and it is just wonderful. And this is a lek in the background here where males come together to show off to the females. Donald knew 40 or 50 different leks at that time, um, uh, which must have been an incredible, an incredible sight back in, in those days. So those birds um, initially did very well out of the, the relaxation of grazing pressure as the vegetation recovered, uh, um, but of course they were pushed to the, to the edge as the, the conifer forests developed. But uh, the bird that Donald is most associated with uh, is definitely the hen harrier. These birds um, had been driven to extinction by persecution on the grouse moors. Uh, they didn't breed at all in mainland Scotland uh, or mainland England either. They were banished to the, the Western Isles and the Northern Isles at the early part of the, the last century. Um, but Donald arrived in the 1950s at a time when um, many grouse moors were collapsing. Uh, the foresters had come, the sheep were going off the, the, the land, um, the numbers of, of passerine prey, small bird prey and voles um, were increasing and, and hen harriers started to be seen. And Donald charted the return of these birds uh, in the early 1950s and he just fell in love with them and in many ways he made the bird uh, his own uh, through his art and his writings which were um, very influential and, and remain important to the study of hen harriers to this day. This is a lovely male. And Donald just loved painting hen harriers. He said that all harriers are beautifully are beautiful, wonderfully graceful, and a joy to watch in, in, in flight. And here he is with his sketchbook out at a nest um, uh, back in the 1970s or 80s, um, painting a hen, hen harriers at the nest. They seem to embody an exceptional combination of grace and power in flight, something which none of the old bird portraits had in the least conveyed. Uh, and they just are anybody who knows uh, any of the species of harrier. They are just something special. Uh, and the hen harriers were just um, a revelation to Donald as he watched them increasing in, uh, in southwest Scotland. And in fact, he uh, recorded the first confirmed breeding of hen harriers in Galloway for half a century in 1959. Uh, and this is one of the earliest paintings he made of hen harriers. Uh, and by his own admission, they look a wee bit like Montague's harriers because he was just getting to grips with the, the birds as they returned. And there were also Montague's harriers at that time uh, recolonizing southern Scotland as well. But this is the Craig of Grobdale uh, on the right hand side here with Cairnsmore of Fleet in the background. It's a very, very loose, impressionistic painting again, and this is a male and female. Uh, the male's about to pass some food to the female, as they do in this wonderful um, aerial food pass. Uh, and the males obviously uh, also um, display very, very um, spectacularly in a sky dance. But this is the first nest site, a very, very important one. And Donald charted the increase of hen harriers as they bred in moorlands, um, and, and, and they moved into conifer forests as well before the conifers got up because of the, the great increase in, uh, in prey and of course the gamekeepers had gone off the ground, they, they weren't persecuting them anymore and the population of hen harriers in Galloway got up to 12 to 14 pairs at its peak in that part of the, in, in this part of the world. Uh, they nested in forestry, uh, John Young and, and um, uh, sorry Jim Young and Brian Turner, two photographer friends of his, set up this hide and invited Donald in to do some sketches and here's a female sitting on her nest in Young Forestry, the male's off getting food and bringing them back to, to her in the nest. And as I say, he painted hundreds, if not thousands of pictures of, of hen harriers and, and made the bird his own in these evocative, uh, wonderful uh, artworks. <clears throat> This is um, in uh, an area which hasn't been afforested mercifully. Uh, his great friend Derek Ratcliffe, who was chief scientist of the 
uh, of Nature Conservancy Council back in those days uh, designated parts of Galloway to stop them completely being swallowed up by uh, conifer forest. This is Airy Hill in the background, this is Loch Skerro here, um, and this is Shaw Hill and Black Craig D in the background. It's got some hen harrier, it's got hen harrier male on the rock, and a female hen harrier, I think, harrying a golden eagle there. Uh, and I think this painting really um, sums up quite a lot of, of Donald's intentions in, in, in his middle and later art. He said, I've always been attracted as a bird painter by birds which bring a small focus of life to spacious surroundings. Um, he also said, uh, all the time I try to see the whole subject and not become obsessed by its parts. And I think looking at that painting, I get that completely. Um, uh, so so the, the, the whole of the subject is important there, but of course the birds bring a little bit of life to it as well. These pines are still there as it happens. Uh, as I say, this is Grobdale Lane and that, that view is, is, is being preserved by the fact that it had to be designated as a site of special scientific importance to stop it being forested. And this is a, a picture I took a few years ago, not quite at the same spot, but you can, I think you can see the similarities. The Grobdale Lane is down there. There's Loch Skerro, Shaw Hill. This is Airy Hill here. Uh, and um, uh, there are still some grouse in that area, etc. Those birds can still sometimes be seen, uh, which is lovely. But of course, uh, forestry was increasing uh, a pace um, in a huge colossal effort which made Galloway the most forested area in the whole of the United Kingdom. This is actually just in Ayrshire over the border, Loch Macatrick on the right, Loch Ricor in the background there, but I think uh, any of you over a certain age will be familiar with, with this style of forestry where it was forestry and nothing much else. This area here uh, where we are is is, um, is triple SI and, and, and it was prevented from being planted by being dead designated. It's the only way it was prevented from, from being planted. <clears throat> and of course, that afforestation of um, southwest Scotland really wreaked great havoc on uh, very important biodiversity habitats, not just birds, but other wildlife as well. This um, map here shows the uh, important uh, peatlands of Wigtonshire and some in the Stewartry as well. And these are of international importance in terms of their carbon sink, their depth, and also some of their wildlife habitats too. And, and just look and see what happened to the, these areas. Uh, most of this landscape was, was devoid of trees pretty much when Donald arrived and of course it was successively planted up including some very very important peatlands just in the same way that the, um, the flow country was uh, further north. Uh, some birds benefited initially. Black grouse, I've already mentioned. Um, golden eagles increased as the gamekeepers went off the land and, and, and prey abounded to begin with. Lots of mountain hares. Uh, grouse multiplied uh, and golden eagles went up to four pairs. But sadly, of course, as the forests uh, encroached, their habitat was, was, uh, was removed. The, the prey declined. And of course, we're now down to only two pairs of golden eagles in Galloway. And, um, and they even planted up to within 100 metres or so of the old nest sites uh, here at uh, on Craig Nelda, very near Murray's Monument. So uh, eagles benefited to begin with, but sadly um, later declined. And I mentioned black grouse earlier. Uh, they, they had a wonderful time. Donald saw black grouse just about everywhere. And I, I um, got information from my uh, colleagues in RSPB just the other day to say that the latest count, I think it was in 2019, um, suggested that they only knew of 61 lecky males in, in the whole of them feast in Galloway in that year. There was no count last year because of COVID, um, but uh, 61 was the, the peak count for all of the leks back in 2018 and 19. And when I tell you that Donald could see 60 or 70 individual birds feeding together on a few sock bushes, willow bushes up in the upper ken, it lets you see just what a decline these birds have suffered as um, as the forests have, have um, gotten rid of the, the moorland and, and these birds were put Push, push to the edge, literally, and beyond the edge. And of course, um, ground predators increase, which are part of the, the story as well. But uh, we're doing all we can to hang on to these birds. They are magnificent. But uh, what it must have been like to have seen 60 or 70 of them in just a few willow bushes back then is just extraordinary. But of course, uh, some birds have uh, multiplied. Um, it's not all It's not all been, been, been losses. Goshawks have increased hugely. Um, one doesn't see much of them, but they're there and they're 
everywhere in these forests and they, they have quite an impact as well. Um, much more rare, but there, there are one or two honey buzzards now in the, the, the forests of Dumfries and Galloway and probably one or two more uh, than we know of. And of course, uh, restructuring has now, um, uh, has now started. It's been underway for some time. This picture was taken by Derek Ratcliffe looking toward Loch D, looking north in the, the heart of the wilderness area. When, Donald, when Derek first came here in 1946, it was completely devoid of trees. Uh, and now they're everywhere with the resultant changes in the, um, the biodiversity and especially the bird life of of those areas. Um, and of course that restructuring is bringing some change. And this is down near Loch Lanou in, in, um, uh, uh, in Wigtonshire. And, and some birds are benefiting from this restructuring, but sadly they, they tend to be the more common birds and the, the, the black grouse don't seem to take to this, neither are, are, do the hen harriers. They don't breed in Galloway, in this part of Galloway at all now. Um, and, and kestrels have declined and, and it's, really, um, it's really some of the smaller birds with few exceptions, but this is one of them. This is nightjar and nightjars are responding in many areas to the restructuring of the forest and, and that has to be a plus. One of the other great attractions um, for Donald in this part of the world really was its wintering geese and th this is a painting that he painted in 1971 um, looking north, northwest towards the rinds of Kells. Uh, they'll rise just out of shot here. This is Glen Lee, this is the, the water of Ken here and there are some Icelandic grey lags here in the foreground and these marvellous Greenland white fronted geese which um, still come to Galloway, both species do. Sadly the white fronts are, are, are less numerous now and further down the glen uh, and changes have come to this uh, to this pasture land as you'll see in a minute or two but uh, a wonderful view it's still there pretty much um, uh, 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 as we see it's a few lapwing up there you can see a couple of lapwing in the in the the top as well but this is Grenon home looking north <clears throat> And this is the same shot. I took this from where Donald would, would uh, make this study uh, just a few days ago. Uh, and the geese still come there. The Icelandic bay lags still come. Um, but it's, it's much more intensively managed now with lots of sheep and, and lots of fertilizers. Um, you can see the rinds of kells in the background there. And um, Donald uh, very often sat in a lay-by. This is the same meadow, but from a different angle. And Donald sat in a lay-by just out of shot there to the left and looking across to the Icelandic grey lags. And uh, up until a few years ago, there was a lovely wet strip of rough, um, of rough land here, which had um, uh, um, phalaris and, and rushes and other wetland meadow sweet and other wetland vegetation and as I was cycling back by in the, the spring and summertime I often heard this bird grasshopper warbler and also sedge warblers but uh, agricultural change it's not all been forestry that's brought the change to the landscape it largely has but of course we must remember that uh, on lower more productive uh, farmland there has been great change as well and this uh, this area was was grubbed up and uh, improved just a few years ago and uh, I'm not quite sure why, but uh, the grasshopper warblers and sedge warblers are gone, uh, sadly. But just a reminder that, that this change is, is continuing and all mostly to the detriment of our, um, our wild birds that Donald uh, so loved and which so inspired him. This is a picture that I took uh, quite recently um, from the Watson Walk that walks, goes around Dorai. This is from Mullock Hill underneath an old oak, looking towards Newfield and Kirtland Farms, managed as a unit. The water of Ken is here and the rinds of Kells, familiar rinds of Kells, which were so important as a backdrop to many of uh, Donald's pictures are in the background here. But this was the last farm, Newfield, which incorporated Kirtland, was the last farm in the parish to have a, a, an arable component a mixed arable component. They always had a few fields of barley uh, or and or oats um, which provided winter stubble feeding for, for, um, uh, for farmland passerines, uh, most notably Yellowhammer which uh, used to come into the village and, um, and feed in our gardens. Donald could have 25 of them. Here's a picture, wonderful picture of, of Donald's uh, buntings. I love them. And this is yellow bunting or yellow hammer. And they would feed in, in Donald's garden. I've seen a couple of dozen there. I've had up to 10 in my own garden, but sadly no longer. That loss of the arable component on Newfield, uh, the baler broke down and was never replaced. And it's, it's really all, um, there's no arable component there now, sadly. And these birds have gone with it from the village, which is, which it's a great shame, um, but a marvellous um, 
portrait of Yellowhammer in its habitat there. Uh, I just love his buntings. This is um, the, uh, a painting, the plate from the Buntings 2 from the Oxford Book of Birds, which Donald illustrated. He wasn't just a great landscape artist, but he was also a wonderful illustrator of birds as well. And of course, in this marvellous book, he attempted both, and I think it works. He said he was always happiest relating birds to their environment. He was also very important ornithologically. Um, he was recorder for about for about 30 years <laughs> and uh, he um, discovered dotro breeding, a, a mountain top bird, really largely associated with the Cairngorms and the, the high mountain tops in Scotland, but they do breed sparingly in Galloway from time to time and he discovered, confirmed the first breeding nest in southern Scotland last century in 1967. This is not it, but this is um, a dotro that he found with his great friend Derek Ratcliffe uh, on another Galloway top and Derek took this picture of the male sitting sitting on eggs. And Donald went back a few um, weeks later and here is the male again with three lovely little chicks here uh, and he painted these uh, in there in situ, took some sketches back to the studio and finished that painting uh, back in the studio. And a very important record, this was 1975 and a brood of Dotro on top of a, a, on a Galloway top. And this is a picture taken by, by my great friend George Christie uh, who was with me uh, on a day just a few years ago when we found Dotro breeding on the tops and I've found them two or three times uh, myself. So very rare, but, but still there, which is rather nice. So where are we today? Well, here we are. We are the most deforested um, region in, in, uh, Scot in the UK, in fact, and um, <laughs> it's hard to believe, but the, the Scottish government have, um, have got huge planting targets for yet more forestry. Uh, and I have no qualms, I have no problem with that, that target. Scotland needs more woodland. It, it probably needs more coniferous woodland. But uh, to my mind and to the mind of most people in the area, apart from foresters, it doesn't need any more conifer forest and indeed we increase the conifer uh, afforestation in this part of the world at our great peril, not only to the, to the, uh, the wildlife and to the bird life that inhabits the, the, the wild land that remains, but also to, to its attraction for people to visit and live in. And, um, and, and this is where we are. And, and I'm, I'm afraid that um, more and more places are coming under the plough and we're seeing a repeat of, um, of, of what, what we had in the, the 60s, 70s and 1980s and, and they have the almost Orwellian affront to call it woodland creation which to me and anybody who knows proper woodlands is, is, um, is well it's not laughable, it's, it's, it's deadly serious. But uh, this is a, an area down at Mossdale, uh, next to Loch Ken. It was greatly, and it's like Galloway in miniature with its moorland, its lochs, and its, its conifer forest and a bit of deciduous woodland in the background there. But this was a great place for Donald to paint uh, chats, and especially Quinchat, uh, one of his favourite birds. And uh, it's these sorts of places that the foresters are now coming back to and, uh, and are planting up, and they're, they're, plant, they're um, planting up areas that were left uh, by previous applications where places like this were left as open ground and they're coming back and planting up some of these areas. This is one, this is Dalry in the background and this is Rigaveri which was planted up very recently um, uh, despite the objections of three local community councils, uh, Dalry, New Galloway and Balmaclellan all objected to this. It was closing up the last enclave of wild open land on the Queensway road between New Galloway and Newton Stewart as if we didn't have enough and I'm afraid that this uh, um, plantation here is going to see us lose up to another 13 pairs of winchats, which are a species that has declined across the UK um, very dramatically. And um, I'm afraid we're going to have to stand up against that sort of um, increase in forestry in this part of the world if we are to maintain what wildlife we have and its attraction, as I say, to live in and to visit. This is uh, these are the rinds of kells in the background. This is the wonderful Haniston Oak Woodland, and this is on Waterside Hill, which again is going to be planted up um, very soon, uh, mostly with conifers. And in fact, most of these uh, woodlands, as they call them, that are being created are in fact 90% Sitka spruce. So, uh, what moorlands we have, they, we've still got a few, we've still got some whops, some curlews, they're declining greatly, um, but we've really got to be vigilant and try to, to persuade um, well, the Scottish Government, really, to, um, if we must have forestry, then please let's have it in places that can still withstand the, the damage that it brings to our wildlife habitats. Um, 
there's been a 55% decline in Scotland in, in, um, in curlew and whops uh, between 1995 and 2012. Uh, we might just be able to hang on to them if we take action now to, to prevent further widespread conifer afforestation. It's not just the, the conifers themselves, but the ground predators that, that the conifer forests bring and encourage that uh, have such a, a, a devastating effect on ground nesting birds like curlew. And just to finish off, uh, I've got a couple of paintings of uh, Donald's of hen harriers uh, in a more positive vein. Um, this is his roost down at Strone. It's, it's a bit stylized, but um, it shows this wonderful choreography of um, harriers in the air that Donald was so renowned for. And perhaps his most famous painting of um, of hen harriers at Airy Flow. Um, I'm afraid it looks a bit different to that these days. Um, the wetland vegetation is still there, the hen harriers are there, not in great numbers, but, but what is happening is this whole place has been encroached by non-native invasive species in the shape of Sitka spruce, which is marching right across um, triple SI habitats and other moorlands where there are, are, are not enough grazers to keep them down. Uh, anyway, um, I'll, I'll leave you. Uh, thanks very much to uh, the Watson family for permission to use um, these wonderful paintings. And I'll leave you with uh, an image of Donald looking over his um, cherished and treasured airy flow uh, where the hen harriers come, came to roost and still do on occasions. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Chris. That was brilliant and really engaging. Uh, and it kind of shows you, doesn't it, that um, we all go on about the climate emergency, but we we speak too little about the biodiversity crisis, which is just as dangerous to mankind. You know, that illuminates the massive change we've had in our biodiversity over the last, well, several decades. And most of those, a lot of those uh, reports you're saying about 60, 70 black grouse uh, in one image, in one field. I actually can't conceive of that. Um, I'm... I'm I've only ever seen three black grouses, most I've ever seen in one place at one time. And, and I would think I'd be lucky to have done that uh, in this region. So it's a, it, it kind of should crystallize our thoughts on how we manage our land in the future and recognize all this decline is entirely man-made um, and, and we, could, we didn't have to do it. Um, I have only one question coming for you. I think it actually came directly to me. And it's from a, a regular attendee of these meetings, Bernie, Sa Bernie Saunders. And he's um, looking at the, the, the massive man-made decline of biodiversity across the region. Uh, yet in the face of that, we're introducing new species. And Bernie always asks questions about beavers. There's no question that this was about beavers as well. Um, is, you know, are we wasting our time doing things like reintroducing beavers when we've got lost so much of our, our um, wildlife to things we've done already? Should we be redressing the balance of that first? And what do you think Donald would think about that? That question's to me, Nick, yeah? Yes. Yeah? Uh, well, I, 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 um, I take the point, but, um, you know, we, we, we can't... Um, we, we, we've got to try and, 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 and harness this increase in forestry that we need to, to make sure it doesn't do any more damage to, to Galloway. That's the first thing. But I don't think that should stop us... Um, making positive change where where we can. I mean, we reintroduced kites a few years ago, uh, and they now um, grace our skies. They, they they are very attractive. There's a niche there for them, and 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 they are a native species. And I think that that is a fantastic initiative. Um, and and we've introduced uh, reintroduced other native species like white-tailed eagles. Not here, but they'll get here um, ultimately. And, and and beavers are native too. Now there might be economic arguments if you happen to be a, a land manager, a landowner, etc. In certain places, I'm sure the law will provide for situations where they, they are uh, creating great damage. But if there's habitat for them, I'm no expert in beaver. I love them. I've seen them. Um, uh, and I have I seen them in this country? No, I've seen their signs, but I've seen them in France and I've seen them in Latvia, Estonia and places like that. Um, but, but yes, why not? I mean, why? Uh, uh, we, we have to address the problems that we have. But but that shouldn't stop us from um, and and I don't I, I don't buy into this um, uh, you know, we spend we waste money or we spend money on some of these projects I mean I, I can't tell you how cheap it was to reintroduce kites because we did it on a shoestring uh, literally um, um, but but some projects are more expensive and and, and are a bit more. Um, 
uh, high profile than others and do get um, mo more uh, budget, but I don't really see that getting in the way. It's really, it, it's for legislation reasons and political reasons that the damage is being done. It's not for, for, for a wee bit of lack of budget in terms of uh, reintroduction projects. That That's my main- I tend to agree with you. I mean, and, and the end of the day, um, you know, the red kite introduction is a demonstration of how successful something that could be. And red kites are now synonymous with Galloway. Um, whereas 20 years ago, red kites were pretty much absent. Um, and, and they shouldn't have been. And they shouldn't have been. They were, they were part of our biodiversity. Yeah. Uh, I've got one last question here. Can I, can I just add something there, yeah, sure, uh, Roger, sure. here? Um, what beavers will do, and we've seen that uh, in Napdale, where the official reintroduction was done, but we've seen it where the unofficial reintroduction was done in, in the Tay, is get back wetland habitat. And we've spent uh, many decades in the post-war period removing wetland habitat. We now realise that it's not just to have wetland for birds and the plants that go there, but it's also extremely important for carbon sequestration as well. And so, if we are really serious about nature-based solutions, which is one of the big issues globally, then we should be encouraging this. And one of the major things that's happened in recent times is for the government, having told my former organization to find a way of exterminating the beavers from uh, the Tay catchment, had to then uh, do a U-turn and agree that they would be statutorily protected except in those situations where there was uh, proven damage uh, to agricultural land. So I think we should be actively encouraging these native species because they help to create habitats and that diversity of ecosystems that we've been trying to get rid of for the last 70 years. Well said. And actually that is a, a perfect segue because our next presenter is Roger Crofts, who has just uh, uh, jumped in there uh, with a uh, uh, observation. Now, uh, Roger, who you just met there, is a, a geographer by trade. He's taught at many universities, worked for the Scottish office, founder member of, of founding uh, chief executive of SNH. Um, he, he, he now is, uh, works really trying to enthuse people about uh, the environment, understand it and care for it more. Uh, Roger's been working with Galloway Glens on the Watson Birds Trail project, um, which is trying to illuminate people about the work and landscape that Roger uh, worked in uh, and perhaps make us think a little bit more deeply about what we can see. Roger, over to you. Thank you very much indeed. It's wonderful to see such a wide representation, not just from Galloway, but from around the world. And I'm particularly delighted to, to see uh, Louise and other uh, uh, relations of Donald's. Uh, so do contact me, if you will, uh, uh, on, on the website. That will get to me. I want to talk to you about a project uh, to put in place some trails. And the whole purpose of the trails is to get people out into the landscape uh, to look at what Donald painting, as Chris has shown so admirably, uh, but then to form your own opinions in various ways. Next, please. I mean, this guy was absolutely amazing. Uh, a very gifted outdoor artist, also a wonderful painter in the, the old studio um, in, in the house in Barone in, in Main Street, St. John's town of Del Rye, and a very acute observer and recorder, and also strong opinions of, about matters as well, as Chris has said, and I'm going to touch on later on. And, you know, here are his books. I've got copies of all of them. I treasure them. I particularly treasure the Oxford Book of the Birds. It's the most wonderful uh, bird and habitat book, I think, in existence anywhere. Next, please. What we are, are in the advanced stage of planning is to put in a walking trail around Dal Rye, follows the core path, and then uh, a much longer trail, uh, a ride on your bike or in a car or a motorbike or whatever. We will set out uh, in the garden, in the town hall of St. John's town of Dal Rye, 
this will be the sign board will introduce you to Donald Watson uh, and to the two trails and also flag up the Watson Gallery in the Smithy in Balmaclellan. I'll mention all of these in more detail uh, during the course of this presentation. What we're uh, doing is uh, working within the context of the Galloway and Southern Ayrshire biosphere. So trying to attract people, residents, visitors alike, uh, to the area so they have a greater understanding of their surroundings. And we're working obviously as part of the Glen Ken's Community and Arts Trust of which we're a component project. And we've been very fortunate in uh, having financial support for this part of the project from the Black Craig Wind Farm Community Fund uh, via the Glen Ken's and District Trust and also through HLF and the Galloway Glen's uh, partnership. Next please. We've already produced leaflets for the uh, two trails. Viewing and thinking about birds and the changing landscape. We are going to refine these uh, leaflets because in the light of our further investigations, we want to change uh, some of the sites, particularly on the art trail. Next, please. All of this will be accompanied by this tremendous guy who you've just been listening to. Uh, who will produce an app for the two lots of trails and for the longer trail at each of the sites. Here he is at McKilston Hill uh, telling people about the site and Donald's paintings there. And that will be widely available on an app which we will be producing as part of a more comprehensive one with the Galloway Glens uh, team. Next, please. The short uh, walk start, starts at the town hall over the Mullet Hill and it takes between one and two hours. It depends how fast you want to go, how fit you are, what sort of the weather is, how contemplative you are. It's, it's, it's a little steep once you cross the main road uh, and start going up the Mullet, but it's perfectly doable. I'm in my late 70s and I can do it very easily. There is one thing. It's all on, in the ownership of one farmer, and he is quite rightly concerned about dogs being not on the lead on this walk. So if you are taking your log, the dogs uh, for the sake of the livestock and for the farmer, uh, please put them on a lead. Next, please. The art trail has uh, nine stops. It probably takes about half, half a day. If you're cycling, it maybe takes a little longer, or if you're one of these young fit guys, maybe quite a bit shorter, but I would recommend about half a day. It's got nine stops uh, in the summer, uh, but in the winter, it only has eight stops because stop number, number six is not accessible. Um, you can't go through the Raiders Road on the Forestry Commission, but you can walk into that site. Next, please. We'll have a sign board at each of the nine sites. This is the, the design. Uh, so it'll show one of Donald's paintings, the relevant one. Chris has already talked about the, this one with the wow uh, or, or the curlew grazing with Dalry in the middle ground and the, the hills in the background. And it will ask you various questions, which I'll come to in a minute, um, tell you where to go for more information, uh, and then also direct you to where you're going next. And there'll be finger posts at each of the points uh, showing you uh, where, to, where to go. The precise sighting will be agreed with the farmers at e each site. And I've got agreement from all of the farmers. I'm waiting for agreement from one landowner and the government uh, Forest and Land Scotland, who tend to be rather slow about making decisions on these things, sadly. Next, please. What we're trying to encourage is, well, what's your view? What are you seeing? How different is the scene now from what uh, Donald painted many decades ago? What do you like? What would, could be much better? How do you react to it? Uh, why don't you take a photo or make a video, write some prose or a poem? These are uh, th three guys from Dal Rye, who I often walk with, uh, Steve, John and Will, 
we have our own views about this. They're all pretty similar, but obviously different generations will have different views. And I think that's a really important part of the process. Next, please. I just want to give you uh, four examples. Chris has shown these, uh, but of how the landscape has changed. So here at the first site at Moss Roddock, you'll see that, that it's more rough grazing. There are not as many birds as, as, as Chris said. Uh, what do you think about that? How do you like the differences? Next, please. This is the, 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 the scene of, of Paul Harrow looking up the glen. Chris again showed this. I'm deliberately doing the same ones. And here's, here's the new, the, the, the more recent picture taken a couple of years, three years ago, actually. Um, what do you think about the difference there? It's not all plantation forestry, as you can see here. There's quite a lot of deciduous uh, trees. Uh, what has changed? What it, what's your feelings about it? Next, please. There's been a much more dramatic uh, change uh, at Airy Fleur Bottoms Isle, uh, as, as Chris indicated. Uh, the hen harrier roost is, is much less. There's bound to be effects of the plantation forestry, some of which you can see there. Next, please. And finally, this, this beautiful uh, scene painted by Donald in 1971. It's still in the ownership of uh, a, a local local guy and he's very proud of it he tells me it was a 21st birthday present and it's a fabulous painting but the scene has changed quite dramatically the the, the land ownership changed relatively recently um, but how will that land use change uh, when finally the Scottish government and Fergus Ewing get their act together and decide that there is a post-Brexit farming regime which suits uh, food production, which suits biodiversity, and which suits the amenity and the landscape of everybody who lives there. Next, please. So one of the major issues uh, that we're facing in the Glen Kems and in the wider Galloway area is how do we cope with landscape change? Here's a quote from Donald in a letter he wrote to Ian Lang in, in December 1987. Uh, Lang at that stage was the local MP. He was a junior minister in the Scottish office. Uh, he became uh, the Secretary of State in about 1992. And he didn't really have much concern for nature. Uh, I was dealing with him when I was setting up Scottish Natural Heritage and he, he, he just didn't connect with him at all. Um, so it's very important that Donald represent, made these representations. I'm very concerned about the huge increase of conifer afforestation in this area. I've spoken to many people and visitors who are horrified at what has been happening. I have noted the many adverse changes in landscape quality and wildlife it has brought. I pause because I could have written that, Chris could have written that in December 2020. Uh, sadly, because the government is in an obsessional uh, course about what it calls woodland creation, but it actually is commercial forest, uh, uh, for, uh, commercial afforestation using modern machinery, which takes no account of the carbon stored in these PT podsolic soils, which is very important in the whole climate change and biodiversity debate. Next, please. And we have these frills around the, the forests of little deciduous margins. The foresters are so proud of the fact that there's 15% of this little margin. But it, if you go into this forest, the floor is dead. Uh, much of the carbon has been released because of plowing, often downhill. The nutrients have been lost into the streams, and we know from the Galloway Fisheries Trust that the quality of the water has had a very negative effect on the, the fish life in the rivers. Next, please. Things can change, of course. Chris did mention the uh, waterside hill planting proposals by the Earlstone Estate. 
it was only because of community disturbance and distress, particularly from Dalrike, as you can see this hill from the village, and it's a treasured place for people to walk. And the, it, we have forced uh, the plans to be improved considerably from a landscape and amenity point of view. And it's very interesting, actually, because this landscape has quite a lot of deciduous trees. But nowhere in the original plans was there an idea to connect those with reinforcing the planting of deciduous trees to create that more natural and native habitat. Next, please. We are living in this area with a very industrialized landscape. But although there, were str there was strong opposition in the 1930s to the Galloway uh, electricity scheme, I guess that many of us now regard that as an important part of the landscape with the expanded Loch Ken and the, and the reservoirs uh, and, the, and the power lines. But there has been a lack of sensitivity uh, by the power companies uh, in the management of the river, so that there is a flooding that is not helpful to the farmland, it's not helpful to the biodiversity at all, because it's not regulated uh, and undertaken in, in the round, the management of this flooding. And of course, there have been lots of debates about the new power lines uh, th that are required to export the electricity from the wind farms uh, into the main grid. Next, please. Well, how do we move forward? It's very easy to be uh, negative and feel quite depressed about it all, but there is a way forward. And despite what I've said about the lack of a forward thinking on government agricultural policy, which Donald would have resounded with, and certainly his son, Jeff, who I worked with in Scottish Natural Heritage, would have agreed with, there is now a land use strategy uh, for Scotland, uh, the most recent version was published uh, last month. And we have uniquely in the, anywhere in the world, as far as I know, a rights and responsibilities statement, which sets out the principles for how we, the public, and the owners and managers and users of land should behave. What we're really talking about here on the, on the road from Money Ive to uh, to the Glen Cairns that you can see on a lovely summer sun, sun, summer evening if you, if you drive over the hill there, which is when I took this photograph. We need to think about how we can increase the integration between the different land uses. So it's not all about conflict between a conifer planting and, a, uh, and biodiversity loss or landscape change. We, think we need to think much more about land use working with nature as opposed to against nature is what we're learning throughout the world. And we can be a laboratory of this in, in the Glen Cairns and in wider Galloway is that the more we work with nature, we mimic nature, then uh, the results will be profound, not just for nature, but for people as well. And we want responsible stewardship to be the norm. And I think it's extremely important that communities who live locally and other wider communities of interest positively influence land use. Next, please. And the way to do this, of course, is through the work of the uh, Galloway and Southern Ayrshire Biosphere. Uh, and there's been a land use planning exercise in the wider area. And there's one going on at the moment in the Glen Kens. I think we have the, uh, a seminar a week on Friday where all sorts of interests can get around the, the virtual table through Zoom and debate about the future of the landscape of the area. So it's not just left to some uh, bureaucrats in the Brown Banana in Castorf in Edinburgh to make decisions or dare I say in my old organization, but we've actually got really important input from communities because that is the way uh, forward. Next, please. Now, one of the things therefore that I hope that you as uh, people who will use the trails or will visit the area is 
you get to feel as a result of Donald's art and Donald's writings, the link between birds, nature and the arts. It doesn't matter whether you take a photograph, whether you climb a hill with the family of my son and, uh, and the grandchildren, or you write a little poem or anything else. Why not take a photo, make a video, write some prose or, or a poem, create some music. We can do all of those. And I can assure you that uh, through Watson Birds, we will put them together and we have the great facilities at the town hall in Dalbry, um, e even the Bothy and the Clacken, which is a excellent um, the sound acoustics, uh, the Smithy in Balmaclellan, and of course, uh, the Cat Strand in New Galloway, where we can feed back all of this to you who have created this material. Next, please. And uh, one of the uh, beautiful opportunities, and I'm glad that Jane Macbeth is listening in this evening, Ken Words um, is an, another local group uh, seeking creative writing. And here they are working together uh, before lockdown last year uh, as a result of looking at the exhibition in uh, the Watson Room at the, the renovated Smithy in Balmaclellan. Bal and we've got lots of ideas as to how we're going to take those things forward. Next, please. There's no reason at all why we can't, as we did some years ago at one of our bird festivals in Dalry, uh, get uh, school children uh, to act, to dance uh, and to mimic bird habit habits. That's it, it really comes home to the children then if they do that sort of thing. Next, please. And there are lots of opportunities in our very musical community, certainly in Dal Rai, of creating music in the town hall, uh, linking uh, birds uh, with music, as well as uh, inviting in those very specialist musicians who have been focusing on that for a, a long time. Next, please. Uh, and of course, we shouldn't forget painting. In previous times, we have had painting competitions uh, helped by the peripatetic art, art teachers like Susan Belinsky in uh, Dal Rai. And you can have these wonderful displays. And then we can also get along uh, professional artists. And there are a lot in the area. This happens to be Darren Woodhead from Paddington in East Lothian, uh, just to give some ideas of his art. And I'm very keen that we can try and promote that as a result of people doing the walking trail and the longer trail. Next, please. And I think vitally important, and this should be clear from what both Chris and I have been saying, that there is societal ethics in, in, in involved in all of this as well. If we are not just creating crimes against bird by stealing eggs, uh, or, or persecuting birds in other ways, which is after all illegal and has been illeg illegal since the 1950s. It's also unethical of our society to be taking away these habitats for birds uh, for pecuniary purposes without thinking about the consequences. And that's a very important thing. Next, please. So we have this small room, uh, in the Smithy in Balmaclellan. Uh, we have just had one exhibition. We haven't been able to mount another one because of COVID, uh, but there are lots of ideas which I'm currently discussing with Ken Words. Um, um, one thing we'll probably do now, it looks as though we can uh, mount another exhibition, is to do uh, a, a, a Donald painting and the current scene uh, for each of the nine sites. Uh, to encourage those people who are going in there uh, to come up with their own views, even if they haven't had an opportunity uh, to go around the trails. So the brochures for the trails will be available in uh, the local shops and in the pubs and everywhere else. And I hope that you will uh, participate in the trails but more particularly, feed back your ideas to us. You can do it through the website that comes directly, directly to me. If you 
send an email to Roger at Watson Birds, uh, and then we can pull all of this material together and we can begin to uh, enhance the understanding and experience about our wonderful area and also provide ammunition against some of the more negative traits that both Chris and I have been talking about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, oops, just uh, that uh, was really great illumination to into work you guys have put in uh, to get the Watson Birds Trail off the ground. Uh, and maybe add a couple of other things that we're going to do uh, to speak for people interested. So in the next uh, few weeks, when the weather gets a bit warmer and my legs get a bit fitter, I will cycle around that trail and create a cycle route app, uh, well, a, a route so that people can be used and that will be spread all over the place. And Chris and myself, I don't know if Chris is going to join me on the cycle ride, and I suspect um, he's probably not wanting to. Uh, we will also uh, stop at each, um, each location and create a little audio book, which we will then put on a, an app called GeoTourist so that you can find out more around that. And I think Roger's going to come down and join us for that as well. So that'll be sometime this, this summer um, on a day of nice weather. Um, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant way of trying to understand the, the changes in our landscape. And I think what we've heard tonight has been sometimes could be seen to be quite negative to what has gone on in the past. I think that's probably a fair reflection. Often what went on in the past, of course, was done with good intention. The good intention uh, often has been the, the downfall of what we've done. I think there's a real opportunity here, as Roger and Chris have both alluded to, for people to maybe get more involved with the decision-making process. Uh, Roger, do you think, I mean, what the way forward in, in, in doing that, would like to illuminate us with that? Yes, uh, I'm, get, I'm, I'm a retired bureaucrat and I'm very frustrated by uh, the, the lack of linkage between the political rhetoric of we must involve people and the decision-making process in, in planning land use planning um, and in forestry planning and lots of other planning and land use change, uh, which ignores the community views. And that's why I particularly emphasize the importance of the exercise that the Galloway and Southern Ayrshire Biosphere have been doing. That's exactly what we need uh, because it's not just the power of the people, it's actually the, extremely important that those decision makers are not just shuffling paper uh, from uh, developers and their consultants who are highly paid, but they actually listen to people who are knowledgeable on the ground. And there are also networks of experts within the uh, ecological environmental consultancy world uh, that are able to help us often informally. And you know, the knowledge level in the Glen Kens is absolutely fantastic. It's, it's all there. Uh, there's a good few people listening tonight who have those knowledge levels and there are plenty of others that we can tap into so that we have not necessarily a uniform view, but we present a coherent case about what we would like to see as the future for the land and the landscape and the people who live and work there. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we should not forget that actually whilst there has been great change, there's still some great beauty uh, within the area and we must treasure that and ensure that that doesn't actually get trampled on as well. Um, we're, we're kind of uh, coming close to the end of the night now. So what we traditionally do at this point is, well, I can just thank you both for doing two amazing talks. I think it's really interesting, fantastic comments. But can I just now ask everyone uh, that's in the meeting to unmute uh, and do your traditional round of applause as if we were in a town hall like we'd all like to be in the future. So thank you very much, Chris. And thank you very much. Thank you.